the voice for Europe and I'm Mary. Well, I'm not in Europe today. I'm actually in Kansas City, Missouri. And I have a fantastic story for you, a story of revival. And this is one you don't want to miss. Kansas City is a historical place with revival. But actually the story takes place just down the road. A town of 532 people experienced one of the most powerful revivals this earth has ever seen. And you know what? It's still going today. And with me, I have the founders of the Smithton Outpouring that happened in 1996. And I want you to hear their story and how revival touched them. I know revival can touch you, and that is going to be our focus today. Revival. What is it? How does it get started? How do I maintain it? Can I have it in my country? Can I have it in my church? And the answer is yes. So with me today, I have the privilege of introducing you to Pastor Steve and Kathy Gray. Thank you guys so much for being hey, on the program today. So Great to be with you, yep. Mary. We yeah. love you. I love you guys very much. And actually, they are my pastors, and we're here at World Revival Church. And I wanted to share them with you. And they've had a lot of experience in revival and pastoring and raising up a generation of people that can carry the presence of God just like ordinary people did in the Bible. And it's really important that we listen to people like this who have the experience and the maturity in the body of Christ because if they can do it, it means we can do it in Europe too. So when did you guys get your start in ministry? Well, we started uh, about a year after we were married. Yeah. We were married about a year or so. Just and newlyweds. Oh, wow. Because we became Christians just five months after we were married. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I did at least. And it just was so life-changing. We decided that we were going to direct our lives towards the ministry. Mm -hmm. And we were fortunate enough to, I think, get good teaching and uh, just solid thinking. So we really stayed on track. We didn't. We, we knew that we needed to learn the Bible, mm -hmm. and we felt nothing is impossible. We always felt like God had good intentions for us. So when the subject of revival, that the glorious power that brings you back to life was needed in our lives or any place, we knew right then that revival can happen any place. It can happen anywhere. Because after we traveled for about six and a half years. Mm -hmm. It was during those travels that God started dealing with me and telling me revival is going to hit local congregations. And that was new to us because mm -hmm. at that time most people were going to conferences downtown of the cities and the coliseums and stadiums. And they, they came from their small churches but then they would go back you know, to go to the big conferences and then they go back to their small churches and nothing happened. So to be able to announce God is going to do something and we use the term revival which is bringing us back to life, putting His glory and His presence in His church where His presence is there, His glory is there, uh, the action of the Holy Spirit is there. And so <clears throat> when we started announcing that and knowing that, we were still traveling. So that began to point us towards, well, if it's going to be in a local church or a local congregation, we better get one. And that's where our story started, yeah. where we ended up in Smithton. Yeah. And God, we had, with our big bus, we would be traveling all around the country for weeks at a time. And then we came home and we lived in this little town mm -hmm. of Smithton, Missouri. And we thought God had planted us there. So when we would come home from our travels, we could relax and rest and not be bothered. But we didn't know just right down the street from us was an old church building built in 1859 okay. during what we call the prayer meeting meeting revival mm -hmm. that swept through the United States. Mm -hmm. It was built then and it was empty and suddenly people in the town started coming to us and saying, would you do something with this building? Would you take this building and um, let it continue to be a church because they wanted to tear it down? So. Yeah, what we, happened, Steve? <laughs> well, we we knew we need to be in a local church, so yeah. mm -hmm. you know we didn't even put any we didn't put applications out or anything, but we knew people around the country because we've right. been traveling. So we the best offer we got was in Chicago, yeah. and a big nice church it had about eight hundred people, and 
they wanted to go over a thousand or twelve hundred, so they picked us out of everybody to come and be like the associates and the up and coming pastors. Mm -hmm. And they gave us a great package deal, house and allowances and salaries for both of us. It was nice. And that's that's something we hadn't had. And so it was really appealing. So we yeah. naturally we said yes. Mm -hmm. And we said we're going. I started and, packing. Yeah. I was packing. I was ready. And oh, wow. we had the house picked out mm -hmm. and so we're ready to go. And it was during that time that these people from Smith Smithton were, they were kind of like fleas, you know, they'd get on me and make itch, I'd make me scratch, because yeah. they kept coming to me saying, would you be pastor of our church? And uh -huh. I, I didn't even know that church existed, because it was just on, even though it was only a town of 552 people, uh -huh. I never went over there because I didn't go to, I didn't live in that town to go look around. Right. And so I didn't even, I'd never been down the street before. And wow. there was an old, that's this old church. And, uh, and they said, our, would you be pastor of our church? And then I realized, well, there isn't a church. It's closed. They had six members, and they guaranteed me those people wouldn't come. <laughs> and so it had no people, no money, uh, really dilapidated, really needed painting, yeah. smelled bad. There were dead birds in it, uh, dead animals in it. Oh. And they're offering me this, and I kept saying, no, I'm not, I can't do that. And I'm going to Chicago. And so we kept that going. Yeah. And then the second time they came back again, they didn't like so much that I was uh, what they probably would have called a Pentecostal or a charismatic. They didn't like that. Mm -hmm. But they were getting so desperate that they would even take me. Whoa. <laughs> That's the truth. That's desperation. I was, you know, in Chicago, we were first on their list. And in this small little town, we were last on their list because they did not want mm -hmm. a lively church. Mm -hmm. But then they, so we're still going to Chicago. Then they come back and asked to have a meeting with me. Okay. And I got, went to the meeting. She didn't go, sat down with these few old people that were left. And they just said, we can't do anything with this. We can't even mow the grass anymore. Oh. So if you'll just take it, we'll sign it to you. And you can do whatever you want with it. Just, you know, try to keep it a church so it doesn't get torn down. Right. And I still told them the story. I can't, I'm not. Yeah, you know, this is a dead town and a dead church that's locked up. It's been locked up for four years. I'm going to Chicago. But I did tell them I would pray about it, mm -hmm. and I didn't really mean it that much, but I felt as I drove back home that I should be a man of integrity and at least go through the motions, mm -hmm. and I did. So when I got home, I didn't tell her she's packing, and I began to pray, and I uh, just laid it out before God. Here's the big church, big salary, big town, big Chicago. Here's the small church, nothing locked up, mm -hmm. nothing in it, no people, no money, a completely dead church in a dead town. And then I just slipped up for a second and I said, Jesus, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And that's when I heard from heaven and it just came out of the heavenlies to me, a voice that said, I'll tell you what I would do. I would raise the dead. And at that point, it's like all the life went out of me. It's like, because I knew, of course, that's what he would do. Of course, he would raise the dead. That's what he does. That's what he's going to do. Yes. And like yeah. I just, I felt like I turned white and sort of just crumbled on the floor and then had to figure out how to tell her. But it was so easy. I just went and told her what happened and she just said, okay, then. It was so easy. The difficult part was yes. calling Chicago because they said, I, I guess you got a better offer. What kind of church is this? How big is this church? How much are they going to pay you? We could pay you more. And I'm trying to go, well... <laughs> There's no money at all in this, you know, so they didn't quite understand. Right. But we did it, and the first, you know, we opened it, cleaned it up, opened it, just the two of us, and uh, I played the piano and sang, and she sang, and uh, invited people to come, mm -hmm. and started announcing that revival is coming to the local church in America. Wow. And, you know, little by little we grew, mm -hmm. and I still kept that message, and I would stand and talk about, imagine people lining up to get into this church. And you got to remember, it's just a little country church, you know. Right. Uh, lining up to get into this place because God's in the house, because His presence is so thick, because the movement and glory of God's here. And it was such a fantastic story. It's like they could believe it, because it was so fantastic, right. you know? And, uh, but I had to teach them then the basics to like, 
they could believe for a huge revival where God would come down and people would line up to get in, but they couldn't believe to tithe or they couldn't believe to give five dollars or something, you know. Yeah, so I we had to start on the basic level, and it took us mm-hmm. 12 years of mm-hmm. pastoring, training, growing, mm-hmm. uh, becoming debt free, and we had about everybody tithing, wow. and we grew in a town of that size to about 150 to 180 mm-hmm. on Sunday morning, which was pretty good size in a town of 532. Right. So it was pretty full. Mm-hmm. And um, but by the time I got through those 12 years. It had exhausted me, and any pastors, leaders, church folks out there know that church is not always the safest place. There's a lot of politics and treachery, and when people get their feelings hurt, or they don't like something you do, or they don't get their way, they don't always use Christian ways to deal with things. Mm -hmm. And I found that out so many times in this little town that this I realized this little town has its favorite ways rumors gossip um, snubbing you not talking to you that's the way they ran people out of town that's why the church closed when I got it oh and it just (laughs) exhausted me broke my heart I couldn't take I couldn't take one more backbiter one more lie no more treachery right I didn't want to leave God but this system it was so heartbreaking and so devastating. I wrote in one of my books, My Absurd Religion, that the religion that was supposed to save me almost killed me. Right. So maybe you'd like to tell him a little bit what I, what I was like and how you got me out and got me back. Well, he, he was at the end of himself. Right. And he was always the type of person who could come up with plan A, and if that didn't work, he would come up with plan B. Right. And he finally got to plan Z, and nothing was working in his heart and in um, his relationship with, with the Lord. It appeared on the surface everything was good in our church, really. Right. And, but then suddenly a few there were a few stirrings from the outside. Mm-hmm. Some of our younger adults that we had entrusted trained them up to try to be and do what we do, mm-hmm. they began to turn on us and uh, got evil. Satan just entered their hearts, actually, yeah. and for no re- they had no reason, but they just turned and suddenly there were some plots to try to destroy us, our marriage, our ministry, our reputation. And there was nothing, no truth in it. I it didn't even lies. know what was going he on. He didn't know. He was so, he was wow. so um, naive and loving. <laughs> Yeah. He didn't notice. It, it was going on yeah. for quite some time yeah. over the months, and I didn't even yeah, know he it. He didn't know it. I just I, kept preaching. Yeah, I just yeah. knew something was wrong, yeah. and it was wearing on me. But when I found yeah. out, yeah. when I found out, you know, when you're kind of on the edge, mm-hmm. when I found out, then I just tumbled yeah. down. He tumbled. Inside. He Not was, the church, like yeah. she said. Yeah. Uh, I was able to keep a good front, but on, in me, yeah. I went, yeah. I tumbled down, and yeah. I, had, I felt like yeah. I had nothing left. Yeah. And when he got to that point, I finally heard about this revival happening in Brownsville, Florida. Okay. okay. And I said, you know what, Steve? How, here's an excuse we can give the church. Okay. I'm going to tell the church I'm sending my husband to this revival to check it out. Right. And I said to him, you've got to go because I don't, you know, there's no hope. There's, it was just a frightful, hopeless feeling time. I said, you need to go there and maybe you'll find God, maybe not, I don't know. So that was the condition he was in and and I was in. When he left, I honestly didn't even know if he was going to return to our marriage. He'll deny saying that. But um, <laughs> I don't remember it. He, you know, he doesn't remember that. He thought, well, he at you know, one point said he was going to disappear into the yeah. jungles of Guatemala, you know, because he felt God was finished with him. Really? Yeah, I yeah. told Kathy that. Yeah. I said, I think God's finished God's with finished. me. God's finished, really? Yeah, and I didn't want to be finished with God, but I'm talking about ministry or any yeah. hope or anything. Yeah. I was completely empty, had nothing to give. Didn't go down there like so many others, like, I'm going to get revival and I'm going to bring something back from God to right. my own. I just went down to find my life and thought, I don't know what's going to happen after oh, that. Yes. And uh, so during the time there, uh, it, I got a little better. And mm-hmm. the first thing I noticed that happened that I didn't have before was a glimmer of hope. Hope came in. So I called back, and that's my first message yes. she had heard from me. I said, Kathy, I think I got my hope back. Because I started thinking future. But before I was stuck, you know, and in 
and and uh, just couldn't go on. So when I got my hope back, I'm listening a little different, and God started talking to me about having a revival, which was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard, because right. I'm in pieces, and I'm looking at these people down there, and they're rah, rah, rah for God, and <laughs> things are happening, crowds, people, and I had nothing to give. Right. But after a week of that, God just, you know, I want you to have a revival. I want you to have a revival. I finally called her, mm -hmm. and I said, this is what I'll do. I will come back. Because I spent my whole day, every day in church, and every, every night in church, and every day in the hotel, just pounding out, reading the Psalms, crying out to God for my life back for two weeks. And so then I told her, I'll come back, but if God doesn't do anything, I'm not starting over. I just, that's it. Mm -hmm. But I'm willing to come back. Yeah. And that's where the story of the Smith and Outpouring begins in 1996. Um, I walked in, I drove home, drove back. Uh, walked into the place the same door I always walked in for 12 years right. and uh, took about eight steps towards her to say hello and suddenly I was struck <clears throat> with a power that was not just something internalized where I say oh uh, God touched my heart mm -hmm. it was God touched everything <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he touched me everything yes. that I am and it was a visible uh, Experience mm -hmm. that you could watch. Mm. You could watch, and she watched it, and the yes. and the, there were all the people in the church were there. Right. So they saw it, and they saw this man come in the door, and visibly change before their eyes and be transformed into another person. Yes. Wow. And all the hurts and all the trouble and all my life, all my life. You know, you've heard the phrase, "Your my my life passed before me." Yeah. It was almost with me. My life left me. You know, and I began to realize this. So this is what a new creation feels like. Like all that leaves and something else comes in mm -hmm. and you're transformed. And just like Paul, Saul yes. to Paul, you know, like he's all of a sudden thinking different instead of being a persecutor. Suddenly he's a preacher. How does that happen? Yes. And that was me. Suddenly I'm devastated and broken and no hope. And, and in a twinkling of an eye, suddenly I'm empowered. I'm energized. I've got hope. I want to pray for people. I'm yes. speaking. I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to sing. I, I went to the cool. piano and started singing. Yes. I went started singing yes. that night. Uh, yeah. And I hadn't sung at the piano for how long, you know. Yes. And... Uh, not knowing what it was, mm -hmm. I just said, I'm coming back tomorrow night yes. to see what this is. But the amazing thing is when that power of God hit him mm -hmm. and he changed instantly, I mean, his <clears throat> posture changed. He started jumping up and down, light and freedom was in his face. But the next second, it's like that power of God that hit him ricocheted off of him and it touched our entire congregation. Wow. And we all ran down to the front and wow. surrounded him and began to worship God. We felt life come in. They were jumping we up and down. Jumping up and down and praising God for 45 minutes. We praised God and we knew that was the beginning of what we learned to call revival, but we didn't know what, then, what to call it then. But we knew we had been touched by God also. Yeah, so on I, some level, everybody in the room was touched, wow. but not on the same level. Right. So personally, you still had to kind of dig it out. Mm -hmm. You had to pray. You had to, you know, it had to be some prayer and repentance. And you had to think, is this what I want for my life? You know, and all that. But yes. everybody on some level was moved forward towards closer to God. Mm -hmm. And so that started. We kept coming back night after night just to see what it was. It was kind of like looking at the burning bush. Mm -hmm. You know, and saying, I think I'll come back tomorrow and see if it's still burning. Yeah. And that happened. A week passed, a week passed, then another week passed, then another week passed. Pretty soon we're in six and seven weeks. And we were going for six services a week then. Uh, wow. By that time, we came back every day almost right. just to see. Right. And by the seventh week, we moved to the weekend. So we went Wednesday through Sunday or, yeah, Wednesday through two services on Sunday. So we had six services a week and pretty soon the year piled up. People came from all over the world. We were on all the TV shows came, reporters came and sure enough, uh, you can see the videos and the documentaries. People lined up around the block and they took photos from airplanes just to see it, you know, wow. to get into that place because the glory of God wow. was there. And that started the Smith and Outpouring. And mm -hmm. so we had six services a week mm -hmm. for three and a half years. And they're long services. And at that time, we began to travel also mostly the United States, some Europe, mostly the United States to bring this into 
churches. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you think a small town of 532 people, how long can it hold? Mm -hmm. A thousand people. Right. Because now the church is twice the size of the town. <laughs> yeah. And this is not the town they wanted. No. And you could feel the strain after mm -hmm. that many years and mm -hmm. the neighbors and people of cars parked everywhere and slamming doors at one o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. people coming from all over the world. I mean, a busload of people from Japan or Singapore or Korea just right. showed up and they don't know where anything is. They're just, they just show up and there they are in this town. And there's no restaurant in the town. There's no gas station in the town. There's mm -hmm. nothing. There's a bank and, you know, so here's these people just walking around town during mm -hmm. the day waiting for these services. Wow. <laughs> so the relationship needed to change eventually. We yeah. came to the point where we were going to make more enemies than friends if we didn't do something. Yeah. That's when we began to pray and that's when God said, you need to move this to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. You need to move it first. And I said, where? And we came, we decided Kansas City. Yes. We needed a bigger place. Mm -hmm. And people thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Said, you can't move a revival. Because we're, I mean, you know, you got to imagine, we're, pa we're at the heat top of this. We're at the top of our lives right now. Right. You know, it's packed out, news media everywhere, everybody's happy, and you're going to do what? You're going to shut it down and move to Kansas City and take it with you. You can't do that. You can't move revival. And I said, I can move it because right. revival is in the people. Right. That's and right. So 68 yeah. households moved with us, mm -hmm. not my plan, but right. I was going to go and thought they'd stay there. But they oh. said, if you go, we go. So 68 households moved That's in right. the year 2000. Well, the people said, this is not only your destiny, Steve Gray. This is our destiny. This is our calling. We've been called as the people of God mm -hmm. to help carry and accommodate a move of God. We've been called to be carriers of revival too. That's what the congregation said. So they That's, came with us. Yeah. And, and what, what proved for uh, us and what's so important to Poland and Europe is we took the excuse away from everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Revival, if it can happen in that town, and I mean, it yes. touched the world. It's still being written about today, True. documentaries, every... Um, if revival can come to a town that size, it can come anywhere. There's no excuses anymore. Right. Any country... So I would go and say, revival, the, the, the reviving presence and power and glory of God, because it's, the revival is not just extra meetings. There's something, God comes, yes. you know, in a greater way. Yes. And, it, 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 and I used to say it can happen any place, any time, any city, any country, any tribe, any tongue, any time. Right. Any time. If, the, mm. if all the circumstances line up at the same time. And yes. we, that's what we learned. Mm -hmm. We came to Kansas City. 9-11 uh, happened in, in, in New York, and people stopped traveling because of that, the fear of travel and terrorism. So now we are just a local church, basically, and we built our buildings, and we got our staff, and we got going in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And then in 2008, got the surprise of our life when the updraft of the Spirit came again on a Friday night. Uh, I didn't, you know, I figured you'd get one turn at this, and my turn was done. Right. And from that... We went on the Daystar Television Network live where we met many of your viewers in Poland Correct. and in Europe and around the world because they're in 200 nations. So we showed revival in a local church right. every Friday night, 90 minutes live. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. Again, it wasn't in a coliseum. It wasn't a special speaker. Mm -hmm. I'm not a guest. This is my church. I'm the pastor. She's the pastor's wife. She's a pastor. This is our worship team. This is our people. And look what God is doing. And it was like a roar from heaven, you know, came. And just mm -hmm. a wave of glory came through on a Friday night in 2008. And it was so notable and so different and so powerful that Daystar aired it around the world. And that went three and a half years. Mm -hmm. right. We did four services mm -hmm. a week. Of course, mm -hmm. you were here. Yeah. Uh, four services a week, I think. Uh, for just about three years or three and a half years with that mm -hmm. and uh, got to meet all these people around the world mm -hmm. including some of our many of our great friends in Poland that's right yes. and uh, now we still believe again there's going to be more surges of power we don't know where right. 
because it depends on the heart's circumstances and the desire of the people because it's God's will to revive us. That we already know. You know, it's a sovereign, it is a sovereign thing of God to have a revival or to have reviving power. It's a sovereign move of God. But God has already sovereignly said, I will revive my yes. people. Because they ask in the Bible, will you revive us again? Right. Well, what's the answer? Of course I will. Of course yes, God will. will. But you've got to have desperate people, desperate prayer. Desperate, it's all desperate because you have to separate yourself from the rest of the take it or leave it crowd. Right. Because this, we're talking about the glory and presence. We're talking about what Moses felt, you yes. know, what David felt, uh, what Jesus felt, mm -hmm. what Paul felt, and what turned the whole world upside down in Paul's day. And now we're talking about that coming in with those surges of power. Mm -hmm. And it can happen any place if we can get the right people at the right time, the right voice. Mm -hmm. And I believe for Poland it can happen. Yes. Poland needs the voice, and maybe we should say either the voice mm -hmm. or voices or people supporting the voice right. or voices and realize that um, you don't have to stay stuck you know, in dead religion mm -hmm. and just church day after day. Yes. The revival is comes from God, right. but it happens in people. Yes. People get revived wow. and they get transformed. They get changed. That, I mean, I was changed. Yeah. And so that's what you know, we want so badly for Europe, but we want it, you know, for our friends in yes. Poland yeah. to first of all, just believe that something can happen. You know, something mm -hmm. changes yes. and God wants to do it. Mm -hmm. God would just as soon do it in Poland as any place else. If the Polish people decide they want it more than any, any other country in the world, then they're going to be the guests of God's glory. Yes. Right? Yes. God's glory will come marching in. Yes. But we need a center. We need your church. We need other churches. We yeah. need unity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need people to have hope. Like, I got hopeless. Mm -hmm. Then I got hope. Yes. Right. We need that miracle of hope, hope, hope that it can happen any place, any time. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned to me before we did this, this program that mm -hmm. some people even have the thought that revival can't happen right. in Europe or can't happen yeah. in Poland. Attitude. That is... I don't even know how to. I don't even know how to process that. No. When I stood in a town on a step of a church of, of, you know, when there were 35 people there, and I'm saying revivals come into this church, and the whole world's going to come here. Yes. Right. If there, if that's not impossible, uh, I don't know what impossible is, but yeah. it happened, and then it happened again in Kansas yeah. City, and now we're talking about we happening again. We talk about a revival among Jewish people. Yes, it's their turn. It is. It's mm -hmm. their turn because. Absolutely. God needs to come full circle around and remember His covenant promises to Jewish people. They need, and, and, and they don't need to be converted. They need to just turn That's right. mm -hmm. to their ancestors, the That's God of right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yeah. mm -hmm. and there they will find yes. that burning bush again. Yes. And that's part of our message, but yeah. Jews and non-Jews alike, this can happen anywhere. Poland could be put on the map as a as a revival center where God is burning like a flame. I think the hearts of the Polish people are perfect. Mm -hmm. the, their history says they're perfect. They need God. Um, yeah. They need hope. They need strength. Yes. They need to be revived. Yes. Why not? Thank you so much for being on our program. And I hope that we get to see you back in Europe. And if they are coming back, you need to be checking in our website because you know that I will be promoting that. And I don't care where you're at, you should come. If it's promoted on our website, you need to come and check them out and see for yourself and let God touch you. And maybe what happened with Pastor Steve and Kathy, I believe it can happen with you. And that God would touch you and bring you hope. And you can take that back to your country because I believe that God wants to raise you up to be a voice. But you have to believe for it. And you have to be willing to do what Jesus did. You know, he laid his life down because he loved people. And I believe that there are people watching this program that you do love people, that you do love Jesus, and you do love Europe. And you know what? God's not looking for somebody else. He's looking for you to be that voice. So thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.